No responses. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Okay, so we'll go ahead and move forward. I thought I'd mix it up by letting you respond to this to ask questions today in case the thought of actually opening your mouth and talking to me is a terrible thing to think about. Oh, there we go. Uh, that's a good question. Can you make assignment <clears throat> 9 due Wednesday at midnight so we can at least attend the 111X? Uh, yeah, I guess so. We'll be moving on. So we won't be talking about assignment 9 in class or that lab, but I'm happy to push it 24 hours. Any other questions coming in? Operators are standing by, but they're about to hang up. It's your last chance. The extra pairing knife is going to be lost forever as the freebie. Can I show some examples of arrays? Um, I can. I will assume is that specifically referring to dynamic arrays. Wait a second. What's up? <coughs> Not much. <laughs> How are you? I'll send this to the Poll Everywhere folks. They'll probably use this in their marketing video. Is that coffee of water? It is a coffee of water. No, I assume you mean or water. Or. Uh, it might be, in theory, it'd be coffee, but it's just water. Actually, oddly enough, it's hot water. I've had this this thing in my throat that's been causing me to cough and get gunk in it, and uh, I find that hot water tends to cut through it. But enough about my biology. That's uh, <laughs> in the viruses that I'm currently harboring. Hopefully, I'll get on top of that one in the next 48 hours. It's driving me nuts. <clears throat> You see, that's a virus right there. All right. So, uh, yes, Wednesday at midnight. I'll push that due date. I'll talk a little bit about arrays. And then 
Uh, there's through Piazza there, there's a bit of a request wanting me to kind of go over, short of actually just giving out the code, kind of show coding up some, if not all, of the Joust projects. So I'll try and dedicate a good chunk of today for that. Okay, next question. Um, all right, so that's <clears throat> the creation of an array that is not dynamic. So you generally have to know when you're writing your program at compile time how large that needs to be. That's the one of the wonderful things about dynamic memory is that you don't have to know until the program's running how much memory you need. And if I was to do that, I would say that I have a pointer to an integer called Bob and then I say that I want a new what do I want a new I want a new bunch of integers how did I know that because I made this int here this can be anything you want right there anything you want I just made it int how many of them do you want? I want 30. Now this actually is uninteresting in that obviously I knew the number 30 when I'm compiling the program as well. So what really makes this more interesting is for me to say see out how many and then see in. I need to create an integer for that. How many? And I get that from the user, and then however many the user enters, that is how many uh, integers I'm going to create. <clears throat> uh, so again, very quickly, what this looks like in Gesundheit. <coughs> the old ribbon of memory thing here. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm fluent with GIMP, but it's uh, the interface is a little bit more kludgy, yeah. um, particularly on the Mac. It, the translation GIMP was originally win written for a, an X Windows environment, and although there's Mac GIMP, which does a pretty good job of putting uh, a Mac-like interface on it, it's still there are a bunch of other clicks. I don't I don't have these tools as easily available. So on balance, I find uh, I find this I prefer this a little bit more for kind of lecturing. Certainly for any true image manipulation, I use GIMP. For instance, uh, check out this baby I got off the web and made a desktop. I just had to GIMP it a little bit to get all the exterior image away from it. Look at that! Isn't it? that's America's 1980s America's favorite family right there? All right. What's the name of the sitcom? Family Ties. Okay, only one person admits to knowing that. I'm the other one. We'll do. Uh, we'll do. Um, we'll do TV. How about? How many weeks do we have left? Five weeks. We'll do TV images Monday. TV. What do I want to say? Monday. How do? I, what do? You, how How does it work for food special? Tuesday taters at the restaurant, so it's Monday 80s images here in 111. Okay, so we'll start that tradition for the final five months. <clears throat> What'll it be next week? Okay. And I, you're wondering what kind of sick mind do I have to put that in my desktop in the first place? And believe it or not, it was for that very opportunity. <laughs> Just to show you, it can be done. I knew someone was going to ask about GIMP, and I wanted to show off my GIMP prowess right there. Um, today's the seventh, so I want to stick that there. I want to call this Array Fun. And I haven't hooked up my small talk, and I don't have my 
tablet set up here. Oh, my apologies. So what we've done, let me go back to the code while I set that up, is we've created a pointer and we've allocated a bunch of memory and the location of that memory is assigned to the pointer. So here's my pointer, Bob. So it does this for Bob. I may as well do the whole thing. I created an integer called how many. So we'll create this integer here. How many. And then on line 9, so let's say I type in, I don't know, I type in 5 here for how many. Uh, then it's going to create, in, this, in my example, 5 integers. It'll be somewhere in memory. I'll start it out here. You'll come to learn in future classes that there are particular locations where it's, uh, static versus dynamic memory is allocated, and they're entirely different locations. So that's why I put this gap here to represent that there is um, a lot of space between these two. Uh, this one isn't, isn't labeled. But I'll, I'll write allocated with new. So that's this. And what happens is that this is an operator. It does some stuff, in this case allocates memory, and then it gives us a number back. And that number is where it found the memory. And it found the memory starting at 112. So the result of this entire expression, whoops, the result of this entire expression is 112 in my, my example here of memory. So it's 112 that then gets assigned to Bob. Yeah, I don't like the green so much. I'll go with red. Yeah, it's a bright green. It's all right for a house wall or a car, but I wouldn't want to do it on my memory here. Um, <clears throat> So I'm ignoring line 10. So now what are we going to do with that memory? Well, I can say see out Bob. We did this last time because what I wanted to show is that G++, this is, no, what did I, erase it. I want three. And then here's that output. This output again is the equivalent of, in my example, 112. So when I say that I want to print out Bob, all it's doing is printing out the contents of Bob, which is 112. Uh, what we <clears throat> want to do is we want to do something using that. Again, this is an operator, and that's the dereferencing operator. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm just going to hard code some stuff here. I'm going to say that Bob sub 1, 0 is 32. Bob sub 2, 1, come on Todd, wake up here. Bob is 55. And we'll say 2 is 98. I'll just leave it at that. <clears throat> so here's an interesting question. Is what the is what does that print out? Prints out 32 because what the asterisk does is it takes an address and it gets the contents at that address, and that's what's happening on 15. So in my dummied up code uh, memory model here, putting the asterisk in front of Bob is basically going to get the contents at 112. And the contents at 112, I did 32, 55, 98. So this is 32, this is 55, this is 98. Uh, it should, I golly, do that. And I run it, I'll say 3 to be consistent, and there it is, 32. Okay. <clears throat> 
But what if I wanted, now this is slightly non-intuitive, is what if I wanted to print out the 55 instead? I need to add something to 112, okay? Now, if you look at my drawing, what you're inclined to say is, well, you need to add 4. And that actually is the wrong answer because C++ will do some stuff under the hood for you. And that is, it'll figure out how big an integer is, and it'll multiply your number by that integer. So, for instance, if I say that I want to add 1 to Bob, then... So when I say Bob plus 1, then what C++ will do is uh, it knows that Bob is pointing to a bunch of integers, so it will multiply the 1 times the size of an integer. Okay, so in my example, I'm making integers 4 bytes, so if I put 1, it'll be 1 times 4, and it'll add 4 to Bob, so 116 would be the result of that. Okay. Uh, it's nice because we don't have to think about it. We don't have to worry about how big a float is, how big an integer is, how big a character is. We can just simply say plus one, and if it's an integer, it'll multiply it by the size of an integer. If it's a bunch of floats, it'll multiply it by the size of a float and so forth. And we can be confident that the plus one is going to take us to the second element. So I do that. I add one to Bob. I get the contents at it, and I should get 55. So if you have plus two, would you get the uh, if you add plus 2, you get the next one. Yes, it would be, in my example, 2 times 4 would be 8. So 112 plus 8 would be 120, which would be the 98. So I've just added, I've just done that there on line 15. Let's go ahead and have a look at that. And there's the 98. Okay, so that works. <clears throat> the interesting thing about the language, though, is it's not doing any checking for us. So what will it, no, let me not choose that number. What will it do if I say Bob plus 16? Is it's going to take 16, in my example, it's going to take 16, multiply it by 4, which is going to put us way out here somewhere, right? Yeah, we can do that, and it'll, let's see what happens. And there happens to be a 0 out there, okay? But... We did not set aside memory that far out, so who knows what's in that position. And this ends up being, I, I talked a bit about bugs with pointers and stuff being the place where programmers spend the lion's time of their shared debugging, at least in C and C++, and that's absolutely true, and it's for this reason. Because the language does not keep you from shooting yourself in the foot. If you want to look way the hell out there beyond where you've allocated memory, that's fine. It'll do the math for you. Uh, and... and this isn't so bad that you're taking a peek here. Where it's bad is if you do, and you set that to a value, right? Now you could be running into trouble. Because now you're changing memory that you didn't set aside. Again, the assumption is that I'm only typing three here. And what's frustrating about it is that looks like that worked. That worked just fine. There's no bug in my program. Right, And that's what's frustrating is it really depends what is 16 out. Because in my particular example, it ended up being some dead space and the program ran just fine. <clears throat> um, but there's going to come a time where there's something valuable there. And that valuable thing you will have changed to 99 and your program is going to throw up. And that is why programmers spend most of their time dealing with the, this as a debugging issue is because it's going to blow up in your face about 1% of the time. And when you've got 300,000 lines of code and once a day your program just falls to the floor and breaks, it's really hard to figure out where that's happening. Because 99% of the time it's running just fine and it's just that one time where it's throwing up. <clears throat> okay, So you're allowed to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, I'm going to do that. There we go. Interesting thing that I've done here is I can do the same thing here. Rather than saying Bob sub 2 equals 98, I can say Bob plus 2 is 98. Let me, let me comment out the bad code here and go back to this. 
Okay. So line 13 and 14, those two lines are equivalent. They're absolutely the same. And in fact, you'll find some interesting things about that should you go through my arrays tutorial, which I'm strongly recommending you do. Uh, that and the pointers tutorial. Definitely, definitely should be doing that. Um, even if you think you got pointers down, it's worth going through it <coughs> and arrays. I can almost guarantee you you'll learn something you didn't know. All right. Uh, so the, the, this would be, uh, for lack of a better term, I'd call this the native form, line 14. But it's, it's much more easy for us to kind of grasp and to visualize by looking at the forms we see on lines 11, 12, and 13. Um, so once you create an array of things using new, or even if you don't use new, even if you did it as line 10, just created a static array, you can access elements of the array uh, this way, or you can access it this way. That goes for whether it's input, whether you're changing it, like on line 14, or output, where you're uh, merely accessing it to print it out. So the variant here is that. So lines 17 and 18 are the same. <clears throat> okay. The only other thing that I didn't mention last time regarding this is... Um, when you're done with the memory, you need to release it. Now, the first part of that sentence is probably the most misunderstood part of that sentence when you're first learning this stuff. Let me say the first part of that sentence again. When you are done with it. You got that? If you use it after you're... Excuse me. When you're done with it, you release it. If you release it, then use it. That's the wrong order. Use it all you want as many times as you want. When you are done with it, then you release it. All right? So how do you release it? You, it the keyword is delete. Uh, I'm going to give you a recipe to follow here. You put those empty square braces there, and then you say what it is you're deleting. So what that'll do is that will, the memory that you allocated for Bob on line 9 is released back to the program on line 19. So delete basically is going to release that and all that memory starting at 112 can be re reused again. Let me say the sentence one more time. When you are done with it, then release it. Okay. So why is that first part abused? Because so many people do this. No, no. Don't do that. Okay, that is what is the effect there? I set aside memory, I come back, I do this drawing exactly like this, and then you release it on the very next line. So I scribble all this out on the very next line, and then you start doing stuff like this, and you're assigning 32 and 55 and 98 here. But that isn't your memory anymore because you released it, which means other parts of the program are going to start using it, and you're going to be clobbering other parts of the program, or other parts of the program are going to be clobbering these numbers here. Okay? Big bug. Got that? <clears throat> as far as the recipe I want you to follow, if you allocate this thing as an array, meaning if you have square braces here, make sure you have square braces down here. Likewise, it is possible to allocate a single thing. So I can create a float point or FP, and I can say FP is equal to a new float. There, I note I did not create a bunch of floats. I just created one float. If I did not create it as an array, then when I'm ready to release it, do not include the empty square braces. Okay. Yes. Uh, right here, you mean? Uh, this is, I haven't, all I've done is now initialize that new memory I'm allocating on 11, uh, so line 22 still stands. Okay. However, you've pointed out what ends up being a really good bug that I get from, on average, two people per semester, is they can't figure out why they are unable, why their program is bombing out. And it looks like this on line 9. So what they've done on line 9 is they've accidentally used parentheses instead of square braces. Square bra Let's say I type in 20 for how many. 
If it was square braces, line 9 would allocate 20 integers. If it's parentheses, it just allocated a single integer and assigned the number 20 to that integer. Right? And so they're going to go on with their loop and they're going to do this thing and they're going to start running off to memory that they don't own. Yes? So if you were to do like um, on line 9 instead of having in how many, if you were to do string, how many in the array, you do that? This can be anything you want. How about night? If you want, uh, right, you're going for the, the you're going to really impress the designers by letting them create 50 nights to go at it. Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. Oh, okay. It'd be anything. It can be anything at all, any type. So string, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Um, the float asterisk or at the top of the other asterisk that you use. This one. Uh, yes, but in the tutorial that's. Um, instead of having to use those gray lines, right, that you said to ignore? Yes. Oh, yes, that's correct. So the, the, the tutorial, uh, again, as it said in the tutorial, the only reason for the stuff in gray is to get the compiler to cooperate. Uh, but I, I'm trying to show you in that tutorial that, that uh, pointers, addresses really are nothing but integers. They're just numbers. And yes, once you then bow to the compiler and do it the way it wants to, then you don't need that stuff in parentheses anymore, and it's done exactly as shown on line 10. So you're absolutely correct. Uh, the um, the reason the reason to me it's kind of interesting is that there are some programming languages that don't have this kind of requirement. There's a programming language uh, I actually learned a programming language called Fourth before I learned C. And it doesn't type its addresses. Addresses literally are considered just integers, and you have a choice of what to do with that number. You can consider it a normal number, you can consider it an address or whatever. So I got to C here, and I was like up in arms, like, who the hell do you think you are trying to make me tell me what my integers are? That's my business, not your business, right? That's, it was a lonely conversation, and I required some counseling after that. But um, Talking to people who don't exist anymore. That's right. <clears throat> exactly. I have a lot of imaginary friends and some imaginary enemies. <clears throat> Good stuff. All right. Uh, anything else on those lines? Okay. So, uh, shift gears, see how quickly I can <clears throat> talk about Joust. There is a desire in Piazza mentioned, you know, let, let's look at the code from the beginning. So let me, let me see how much I can do of that. Oh, darn it. I can't. I'm going to have to, I think what I might do, thinking out loud here, I think what I might do is sit down and I'll go through the whole coding of Joust and maybe I'll just post that as a video that you can check out on your own time. Because I just realized that uh, there's an element of this assignment that I haven't talked at all about, and that is the standard template library. Okay, <clears throat> so stay tuned for the the Joust extravaganza, and now let's talk about the standard template library. So the reason for the standard template library is, I guess, there's a reason for the name. I'll talk about that in a moment. But there are things that you do over and over and over again as programmers. And if there's one thing that programmers shouldn't need to do is they should not need to reinvent the wheel. All right. Uh, also, there are, are things that take a lot of code that are convenient if they're coded up. And so it's nice to have things that make life a little more convenient for you. That's what the standard template library is. is it's standard. That the standard word comes for the same reason that we have using namespace standard. There are things that are included in the language, uh, which they put in this STD. So you have to say STD colon colon next to all this stuff unless you do line two here. Okay, just the same way as uh, having to do it before C out and end line and so forth. Now, what is in the standard template library? A huge ton of stuff. Um, the, re the template is actually a, a, a syntactic construct in the language. And I'm not sure 
whether they talk about templates in 2.11 or 3.11. In fact, I don't think they're talked about a whole lot. I, I work with templates a little bit more in 5.11, if anyone takes that as a, an elective someday. Um, but the reasoning goes like this. Let's, let's actually <clears throat> talk about why templates are useful. What if I want to swap two floating point numbers? Uh, let's see. No, I, I want to do the maximum. So I want to find the maximum of A and B. So I'm going to write a function because I'm going to use this a lot. And I'm going to say if A is greater than B, return A. If uh, else, return B. Yeah, pretty straightforward function. So now if I want to use, actually, maybe I should put this, I'm going to put this in a different set of code, um, STL stuff. Now I can go ahead and I cre can create my float A my float B, and presumably you're reading these numbers from a file or getting them from the user. You wouldn't be hard coding them the way I am. Um, and I can say max is equal to, and then I can call this function. Okay. <clears throat> Everyone buy that? Should be no mystery here. Whoops, it's G++. Kill stuff. And 3.14 is the max. All right, no big deal. But here's the issue. I want to be able to do this for integers as well. Let's write a function for integers. Max takes an integer A, takes an integer B, and then I say if A is greater than B, return A, else return B. All right? And then I can go ahead and write code to put down here. Oh, but I also want this to work with um, characters. So I say character max, character A, character. Everyone see where this is going? I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again. The only thing that's different between all of these is the kind of thing that I'm manipulating, the type. It's either character, integer, or float. Otherwise, it's the same. Okay, there is a, a, a construct in C++, not in C, in C++, called templates. And what it allows you to do is to write a function like this, but you don't specify the type. You just do something like T. Now, I'm not. it's beyond the scope of the course for me to go deeply into templates. Um, <clears throat> so this is incomplete. It won't compile but I want to give you the idea of, of what's behind templates. So when you write the function as a template, you just write it generically like this, saying at some point in the future, I'm going to plug in a, a type. And uh, you don't have to do it in all. It depends on the circumstance where you have to do it. But when you do have to plug in the type, uh, the way you do it is with angle braces. So when you all have been reading the resources, they're probably talking about vector a lot, and they're saying, let's create a vector of floats. All right? And I haven't talked about vector at all. We'll talk about vector in a little while. But if you're wondering what that funky syntax is, what we're used to doing is stuff like this, knight, k, right? So what's new is this stuff in the angle braces. And what has happened is that vector is a class in the same way that knight is a class, and vectors got you know literally thousands of lines of code to it, but they've made it all generic. The way I've kind of represented it up here on line five. And when you're ready to use one of these things, this is the way you say to take that generic type and make it float. So that's what is actually <laughs> happening. <clears throat> So vector, so the standard template library has all sorts of things, utility functions and so forth, has containers. A vector is a type of container. 
Interestingly enough, a vector is made to behave very much like an array. Uh, I'll talk about the advantage of vectors another time. Uh, but what you need to use is you need to use the algorithms. So I can go here. I can say C++ STL algorithms. And there are a lot of interesting things you can do with algorithms. <clears throat> Here's one that's interesting. Fine. So let's say you have an array with like a thousand things in it. You can say, can you find and see if there's the number, let's say it's a, an array of a thousand floating point numbers. You can use this find, util, uh, find function to try and find the number 3.14 in that array of a thousand floating point numbers. Uh, you could certainly write it yourself, right? How would you write it? You'd create like a for loop and just start going through each of these items in your array till you found one that matched 3.14. That kind of thing you need to do a lot. So that's why they're providing that. Uh, count. How many times does 3.14 appear in my list of a thousand numbers? You need to make copies, move things around, swap things. Uh, fill is an interesting one. I want to, for all those thousand numbers, I want it all, every one of them to be equal to 3.14. So you could do something like that with fill. You can remove things. Uh, a whole bunch of algorithms. And of course, the one that we need for assignment nine is sort. Now, it, it's... This stuff's hard to understand, and it's not expected that you read through this and understand it completely, but I want you to start noticing some things. So you see this word template here, and you see these angle braces. So you can see that the sort function was written generically. So you can sort a list of floating point numbers, a list of integers, anything you want. You could sort a list of knights if you had set up the knight class correctly. <clears throat> So that's what this is saying. It is That's a little syntax saying that this is a generic template. The function never returns anything. It takes this thing. Who knows what this is? Random access iterator. Uh, but a couple helpful hints, first and last. So in order to use this sort, it needs to know where the first thing is and where the last thing is. <clears throat> and... Let's pretend, for the sake of argument, that my dynamic array here has only three items, right? So it caps off, where would that be? About right there. So let's say that this is the actual size of my dynamic array. Where is the beginning of it? Where's the last one? All right. Now it turns out that with uh, these kind of things that, that go through is that it doesn't want to know where the last one is. It wants to know where the end is, which means essentially one past the last. So 112 would be uh, what did I call this pointer? Let, let me go back to my original code. So I called it Bob. All right. So I allocated this memory here and I assigned it to Bob. <clears throat> so first, I wouldn't actually hard code the number 112. What would I write? Bob. If I wanted to know where the end of this array is, if Bob plus one is right there, three, yeah, absolutely. Bob plus zero, Bob plus one, Bob plus two, Bob plus three. That's the end of it, yeah? Should we do a little sorting? Uh, 
that you need to include. <clears throat> this has to be float. Uh, I've already got that sorted. Let's mix this up a little bit. Let's make this zero, this one, and this two. 55, 98, 32. There, now it's not sorted. <clears throat> so let's, let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of that. Get rid of a bunch of this stuff. Okay, so I'm going to print out Bob 0, Bob 1, and Bob 2. Always check to make sure my code is good. Whoops, G++ arrays. Uh, these are integers, not floats. My bad. All right. Five, 55, 98, 32. That's just the way I entered them in, right? Let's go ahead and sort them. Sort. Sort wants, again, we don't understand all this, but it wants the location of where the first number is, and it wants to know where the end of the whole thing is. All right? So we said the first was Bob, and the end was Bob plus 3. Not Bob plus 2, because that's going to, it doesn't want to know the beginning of the last element. It wants to know where the end of this whole chunk of memory is. So, so you, you're, it's one more than your last index. But note that this number is easy to remember. How many, how many elements are in your array? Three. Where is the last element? Or where is the end of it? Bob plus three. Right? It's just the same number as the size. Let me print it out again. Let me print out a little one of these to kind of separate them. Any questions on that? Can you sort it in reverse order? Can you sort it in reverse order? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if I am going off memory here, I'm going to say R sort. Nope. It's, uh, no, criminy. Let me see. C++, C++ reverse sort. So it would actually be a separate uh, you know, there, it depends. There are weird iterators you can go that move backwards, so there's a way of providing special iterators that move backward instead. And that would would probably do it. Um, yeah, you see that's what they did there. Huh, you do that. And that's a clever way of doing it. All right. Yes. So you wouldn't just be able to do Bob plus three comma Bob in reverse order. Uh, you can't nope. because what it'll do. So the way the way this works by default is it's going to start here and it's going to stop when it reaches this location, and it's going to add one each time. So it's going to be Bob plus three, then Bob plus four, then Bob plus five, then Bob plus six. And so it isn't intelligent enough to do it in reverse order. There are, if you're dealing with, if you're not dealing with a built-in, the problem is I'm dealing with built-in arrays here. If you're dealing with a template type like a vector, which again is made to look like an array, you can actually provide it what are called reverse iterators. And then you do provide it like this, but you say these are reverse iterators and it'll, the iterator itself knows to count backward. Uh, but let's try, so I stole this code. Let me, let me try this and then see if I can talk about it. Um, what do I got going here? I still have the R sort. Yep, and... Ooh, it did not like that at all, did it? <clears throat> no, that's because I have this still. I'll explain this, what I'm doing after I'm sure it works. Here you go, got a reverse sort. 
If I look at this, oops, not this. If I look at this, nope, not that either. Hang on. If I look at this, there we go. There are two versions of this function. This is the default version which we were using. I provide the beginning and the end. Okay. Here's another version. I can provide the beginning and the end, and then I can give it a function telling it what function should you run to do the comparison. Now, normally, what this the function that it uses by default. The elements are compared using the less than operator for the first version. So I can get a reverse sort by just reversing that operator to do greater than instead. Unfortunately, it's using some stuff we're not familiar with yet. It's obviously in the standard library, but the standard library uh, has a, a function for uh, representing greater than, and that is the word greater, and then I say what kind of thing. If I was doing this with floats or with strings, I'd say float or string there, and that would be an easy way for me to reverse it. Uh, anyway, a little bit too much information, certainly for assignment nine. Should be able to cap it off right there. Yeah? Can you um, ask it to, to look for uh, a common expression, and say, in a group of arrays, and then take those out, like looking for say a certain gene is expressed a few times in a big book. You can, do, you can do a count. You can find out how many of something there is in a list. You can have it tell you where all, all of them are. You can have different sets and do unions and intersections. You can do set manipulations as well using the STL. There's quite a bit of stuff in the STL. So it's a good way to sort your Yeah. So again, part of, the, part of the reason for having this in assignment 9 is to make you aware of the fact that the standard template library exists. And the minute you're starting to do something that you think, maybe someone's done this before, they've probably done it before, and you should get on and start looking through the standard template library to see if it, it's in there. Okay? Um, and we, we'll be doing some more work with the standard template library moving forward. All right. Let's do the, the magic word or the secret word or whatever the kind of word it is. The tasty and delicious word. I don't remember if I've done this one before. I have, it, I have the sense that I had done it earlier in the semester, but I hadn't been keeping track of the words early on. Eponymous. So, like, uh, Tom Sawyer is the eponymous hero of the novel. What is the novel? Tom Sawyer. Right? <clears throat> If my name, if my name was actually CSCI 111, I would be the eponymous instructor of this course. All right. Okay. Bang out assignment nine. We're going to be moving on.